So, Paul, happy Halloween. Wait a minute. Yesterday was Halloween. Oh, we missed it. Mm, I thought tomorrow was Halloween. No? No, that's the day after? Wait, what day is it? When is this? Where is this? We, For those of you who are confused, we're recording this the day before Halloween, and it will go up the day after Halloween. And so, um, but we don't really have any Halloween topics to talk about. So, like, whoops. I will say... I do like that my neighbors are decorated for Halloween, and I notice a curious change in Halloween customs. I notice an hmm. awful lot of people decorating with pumpkins that have not been carved. Oh. They just put out a pumpkin, just like, here's a pumpkin. And that's cool, but like, kind of weird. It's like kind of putting up a Christmas tree with no decorations on it. It's just like, yes, here is a plant that reminds you of the <laughs> holiday. I, I've got two of those in my front yard. They're just trees. <laughs> right. Well, we've just got a couple of, you know, what are, what are pumpkins? Squash? Gourds. Gourds. We've got a couple of gourds sitting here. Nobody carved them. I mean, th there are carved pumpkins around the neighborhood, but there are also, like, there are more. I've seen at least three houses with uncarved pumpkins out in front of them. And that's not even including us. And we are yet another offender. In the, uh, close enough, it's a pumpkin. I'll just leave it here. School of decorating. The abandoned pumpkin approach to Halloween decorations. <laughs> you could, you could carve pumpkins and then swap them out for uncarved pumpkins. Right. Well, um, yeah, so I don't have anything else to say about Halloween. We have no Halloween topics. We have no, I've played no horror games. Um, so I guess we'll just like move on from Halloween. I hope everybody had a good one. Uh, in the topic list, Audacity. Talk to me, Paul. Yes, uh, they just released a, a new update. So if anyone isn't up on the Audacity scene, they've fixed a number of things that were just, it was just the perfect update because it's like, hey, do you want to move your clips around, but you don't have to want to have to like select the move tool? We got, but you can do that now and you can like trim stuff without deleting audio. And it's just, it's fantastic. The the update is, is so good. Audacity is so good. Yeah. So uh, I'll bet you Isaac's hearing about that for the first time right now, listening to our show. So, because Isaac is our <laughs> editor. So, mid-show, he's probably going to, like, stop editing and go get the new version of Audacity. Actually, if I know him, he'll wait and download it afterwards and use it next week. <laughs> because I didn't raise no fool. <laughs> Don't switch software versions in the middle of a project. Oh, man. Yeah, please. Well, speaking of switching software versions, uh, Windows 11 is out now dudes what i mean i i saw previews of it i saw people like oh here's the windows 11 preview and i thought oh boy in six months that's gonna be a thing it's out now well maybe i spoke too soon wait what let's see i'm searching right now windows 11 announced on june 24th 2021 so maybe it's not out Initial release date, October 5th, 2021. Yeah, yeah, it's out. It's out now. Uh, that's weird that it's out and I've barely heard about it. That's, I mean, I've seen like two YouTube videos that were like, not a big deal. Just here's, here's a look at the new Windows 11. And I didn't realize it was out. I thought this was a preview version. Weird. Um, I was kind of hoping yeah. they'd finish 10. <laughs> Isn't that always the hope? Right. I'll bet you everything will be fixed in 11. If I just upgrade to the latest version, it will fix all of my concerns. Well, you might have trouble with that because on a whim, I, I so I was updating my computers because I like to update them before it forces me to. So then it's like, it's out of the way, you know, right. on my schedule. And uh, so I was doing a Windows update and then like in the update menu, it's like upgrade to Windows 11 on this PC. And I'm like, really? Huh. And I was doing this on an eight-year-old laptop. And so I was like, okay, sure. you're on Microsoft, do it. And it's like, oh, wait, uh, this PC doesn't meet the system requirements for Windows 11. And I'm like, yeah, I know. It's an eight-year-old like laptop. There's no <laughs> way this is going to be able to work on Windows 11. And so, uh, you know, install the normal updates and close the thing down. But then I got to thinking, I'm like, what, what are the system requirements? So I sat down at my two-year-old desktop computer, which at the time was uh, bleeding edge. It wasn't awesome, but you know, it was pretty good. And I was like, it's got, this one's got to be fine. And uh, so I did the like install Windows 11 thing. And it's like, oh, uh, sorry, this, this PC doesn't currently meet all the system requirements for Windows 11. I'm like, hang on here. Wait a minute. What's going on? Is this just 
is Windows 11 actually out, or are you just saying it's out, but no one's PC meets the requirements? <laughs> right. That's all it is, is a dialogue that says that. <laughs> right. You, you could upgrade to Windows 11. It's just part of their partnership with Intel to sell more chips. <laughs> right. Just get everybody you can only to get it upgrade. from a new computer. You can't install it on your old computer. So I looked at the system requirements. I'm like, okay, well, what are these requirements then? What are these, these magical requirements that I have to get like a blood test or something? And it turns out that one of the requirements is that you have to have the install of your your current install like locked to your microsoft account or something there's some sort of like login requirement with your microsoft account that you have to do mm, in order to upgrade right. to windows 11. whatever i mean yeah. i am not surprised that would be fine but i have um a particular experience with my microsoft account which is that i've got kids who like playing minecraft and there's minecraft right. Java edition, and then there's also Minecraft Bedrock edition. I'm doing the, the air quotes, you can't see them, but Bedrock is in air quotes because that's actually just the Windows 10 version that's in C Sharp. Um, so it should be like the C Sharp version, but whatever. And the C Sharp version I got for free when they had a promotional, but it's locked to my Microsoft account. And then my daughter wanted to buy a copy of Minecraft Dungeons, but Minecraft Dungeons, let's see, how does this work? Minecraft Dungeons you can't you can't play it on your microsoft account you have to play it on your moyang account and so but when you log into the launcher it's a, a combined launcher for both minecraft bedrock and minecraft dungeons and in order to play both of them you have to log in and log out of both accounts it, it's just the worst it's just this is the, the worst. most the most microsoft thing i've ever heard of <laughs> i know like, nobody at that company understands anything about, like, usability or just, like, seamless. Like, it never occurs to anybody that, hey, maybe we should make this convenient. Maybe we should make right. this clear. I had the same, I had the same sort of, like, re, re, um, when they introduced Game Pass for PC. Xbox, Game Pass for th PC. Which sounds oh. like, which sounds like... Apple Game Piece for a, Apple Game Pass for Amiga. It's just like this oxymoronic nonsense. Like what? <laughs> yeah. Xbox for PC. That's those are two different platforms. What? And uh, <sighs> it was similarly just like so confused, just needlessly convoluted. You just come in and you're like. Here, I have some money. I would like your product, please. And they're like, all right, welcome to step one of this 12-step <laughs> branching. <laughs> right? This 12-step branching adventure game where you have to figure out how to get us to sell you something. <laughs> you know, it's like, come on, just take my money and give me the thing. It's not like you have limited copies of it. It's a digital product. <laughs> right? Right? No, you joke. But I had that happen. Uh, Games for Windows Live, if you remember that, they had a promotion uh. where they were giving away Age of Empires for a dime. And I went through all this nightmare and I had to upgrade it and then I had to upgrade Windows to get the upgrade for Games for Windows Live. And then uh. I had to download it. And then once I downloaded it and ran it, they're like, we're out of keys. <laughs> no! <laughs> no, Microsoft, why? Out. They ran out of digital copies. It was uh, the most deliciously stupid thing I've seen them do. It is oh, no. wonderfully awful. So, okay, so to, to kind of wrap this story up, I um, you have to log in, log out, and it's just it's so dumb. And But they've got a little thing at the bottom saying, like, you can migrate your Mojang account to a Microsoft account. And I was like, awesome. I'd love to do that. I'd love to stop typing this password, the, both of these passwords in which are different into your login box all the time. And so I clicked on that thing and it takes you to the Mojang login. And so you log into Mojang and then you're just like at your Mojang page user profile. And it's like, okay, how do I, what you promised me that I could migrate. And then you go into the migrate thing and it's like, oh, this is only available for some accounts at this time. We're like migrating them slowly for some reason. Why would you do that? <laughs> 
And so like, so I closed that out and left it. And like a month later, it the pop-up changes to like, your account is now eligible to migrate to Microsoft. So it's like, like this is some big privilege that I'm getting somehow. And We're so I click on the thing you again. To fill out the paperwork to change the account login details. Oh, yeah. I, so I click the thing again. It takes me back to my Mo Yang page. Still, there's no link for like, migrate your account. It's just like your login page. So I poke around there for a while and I finally like search, how do I migrate my Mo Ying account? And it's just like an endless like cavalcade of nonsense where like everyone's saying something different and no one knows what's going on. And so I'm like, okay, so this is, this is still a fantasy. And so now they want me to integrate my PC's login with that system, with that entire ecosystem of nightmarish oh. nonsense. Where it's like, hey, do you want to use your computer for things that you actually want to use your computer for? Who knows if you'll be allowed to today? Oh, I, you know what would really make that infuriating is my computer has this weird thing where when you bring it back from sleep mode, it won't get, it takes it about 15 seconds to get on the internet. Like I, you know, get past the login screen and it just has to sit here and think about it for like 15 seconds and then it starts talking to the internet. So if I had a Microsoft login, I wonder if it would even let me in or if I'd have to sit there for 15 seconds and wait to get online before I could like get to the desktop. Yeah, or or if it will like keep trying to log in and then it'll be like, oh, so sorry, too many login attempts. Please wait half an hour before logging in again. Right. Oh, I have a I have a little rant about this. I express oh, concerns God. like this. I I express concerns like once in a while. Oh, what happens if I log in and it, you know, and I'm not online? And I can't do that. And I'll have people go, well, Seamus, actually, if you tried it, you would see it. It won't actually log you out. You're just being a grumpy old man. And I'm like, kid, this is not my first radio rodeo. <laughs> It isn't like I'm just making up these these crazy conspiracy theories out of nothing. Like I'm just imagining <laughs> like I've gone through this before. This is uh -huh. stuff that Microsoft has done in the past and continues to do even today. So when I suspect that something's going to be horrible, it's not because I'm looking for things to complain about. It's because of personal trauma I've experienced at the hands of their interface design. And with the invisible scare quotes again. Yes. So, yeah, maybe it's not horrible. It could be fine. But it could also be a nightmare that'll break your computer and make you have to restart or reinstall Windows. You don't know. Yeah. Well, tell me about something entertaining that doesn't involve some sort of totalitarian nightmare. Well, I watched Dune. Uh, so the new Dune movie is out on stream. This confuses me. Having brand new movies show up on streaming. I mean, I'm not complaining. I don't want to go to the theater. Have some kid kicking me in the chair, in the, you know, in, in the back of my chair, while the person beside me coughs all over me. <laughs> and the woman in front of me has a beehive ha hairdo. An anachronistic beehive hairdo for no reason and blocks my view of the screen. <laughs> Role playing like, as Marge Simpson, right? <laughs> I don't know why you came to Dune, came to Dune dressed as Marge Simpson, but okay. They were released about the same time, right? Actually, they weren't. Dune was like a decade before, but whatever. Right, and like I don't, I don't know why I paid twenty dollars to see this movie in this vastly inferior format, but you know, so great <laughs> right. home streaming. Why did we ever bomb. put up with this? Right, like this is. The, the pandemic has been an absolute shit show, but I, I don't mind if I don't have to, like, go back to the theater and I can just continue to watch movies at home. That's okay with... I get a pretty good setup here. I'm pretty happy. Oh, yeah, and I don't have... The, my other theater gripe is theater speakers that are too loud. My oh, They're goodness. always too loud. Oh, it is actively painful. Uh, when I saw Blade Runner 2049, I actually, like, was dazed. I felt like I'd been hit by a flashbang grenade when I got out of the theater. <laughs> I just sort of shocked and staggering out of the room, like, oh, the strobing lights and the deafening sound. Oh, get me out of here. If you can't feel your sternum vibrating against your spine, it's not loud. Right. So Dune, I've never read the books. What? And uh, I, yeah. How is that I, possible? 
I watched the David Lynch Dune way back in the day, starring Sting and Captain Picard. Um, yeah. And and I did not dig it. I mean, it it was a David Lynch movie, and so it was like very weird and <laughs> did not make not me... only weird but David Lynch weird. Right. It was David Lynch weird and sort of inscrutable and hard to understand, and the number of people who whisper in doing asthma videos explaining shit to you while you're trying to watch the movie is really annoying. Oh, the whispering <laughs> scenes was just the worst. And there was like four hours of just people whispering their inner dialogue in, in voiceover. It was torture. So I never wanted to read the Dune books because the movies were so, the movie was so bad. I, well, to be fair, uh, that's a pretty good adaptation of the book, honestly. <laughs> um, but then I've watched the new one, and I got to tell you, it made me want to read the book. Now, now I actually want to read the book. Hmm. Uh, I really dug this new, this new film version. The one thing about the movie is that it has a distracting number of people from superhero movies in it. You mean like actors? Yeah, actors. Okay, here's the lineup. I'm gonna talk about. The number of superheroes that are in Dune. You know, they're actors, but Thanos, Aquaman, Drax the Destroyer, and Polka Dot. So there's four superheroes, plus <laughs> Eric Selvig, a uh, friend of Thor, and Mary Jane, a uh, girlfriend of Spider Man. So that's six people from recent super from the last superhero movies of the last 10 years. Now, that makes sense to a certain point. I mean, that's who's hot right now. And this is basically all of the B cast from all the super movie, superhero. Obviously, nobody's going to put Robert Downey Jr. in this thing. It already cost one hundred and fifty million dollars. You you try to put like Robert Downey Jr. or Chris Hemsworth in it, and it just you'll never be able to afford the movie. Man, that's still though. That's a lot of. I mean, like I recognize all those people. Um, yeah, Polka Dot is interesting. Um, that's played by a guy named David Desmalchian. Desmalchian? Um, das, I don't know. It's this unpronounceable last name. Hang on. Let me look it up. David Desmalchian. So my, my initial instinct was roughly correct. All right. He, he, I've seen him in three movies so far that I noticed him. And he has not survived to the end of the movie yet. <laughs> I've never seen him I survive a movie. So, like, the joke is that Sean Bean was the actor that always dies, but I think this this guy is inheriting that title. <laughs> Spoilers for every movie he's been in, by the way. Right. Um, yeah, so I loved Dune. I don't know how accurate it was to the books. I'm very curious. to. Well, the other thing this movie did is I just noticed so many references and names and, like, Oh, there's that. Oh, I've seen like a hundred people that have that name as their handle in a forum. I always wondered where that was from. Oh, you know, sure. The, you know, or, oh, I see. That looks like the thing I've seen a million times, but never knew what it was. And, you know, you can see this as the source for so many, so many things have borrowed this from Dune. Yeah, yeah. Dune is a is a classic sci-fi. I mean, as much as sci-fi has classics. Right. So it was really good, but I'm very curious to hear from people who have read the books and now seen this version. How does it feel to you? How do you like it? Oh, by the way, this movie is only the first half of the books. They're kind of doing a... They're doing what they should have done with The Hobbit, which is split it into two and not into three. Hmm. Um. The dividing point is kind of weird. Like they have this wonderful, huge blowout, exciting thing. And you feel like, wow, that was quite a movie. And then it just keeps going for like another half an hour. And it's weird. <laughs> oh no. Yeah. And it's like, then it ends on sort of a very like, oh, we're, we're stopping here. Like we had a great finale. And then you, and then you had another half hour of other stuff why didn't you cut it there i don't understand i guess they're i guess they didn't want like a two-hour movie and then a four-hour movie and this div this dividing point was you know so that they could have uh 
more balanced. Two, three hour movies two. or whatever. Right, right, exactly. Hmm. Anyway, that's my report on Dune. I really liked it. Nice. Well, I've also been engaging with fantasy this week. I picked up a copy of Wildermyth. Uh, W-I-L-D-E-R-M-Y-T-H. And it's a procedural kind of storytelling RPG game that is very stylized and very fun. Oh, all right. So what platform? Is this like a is this like an indie game on Steam? It is an well, I, I don't know how indie it is. It's a game on Steam for sure. Uh, that's where I got it. Um, it's got I, I think the main quest stuff is pre-authored. And then there's some, I, I think it's all actually all authored, but then like the location of things on the map is procedurally generated or something. I haven't played it quite enough to know what parts are procedural and which parts are, are authored, but uh, it does seem like a lot of it is, um, is pre-authored. Although it seems like some of the like character dialogue is based on their personality. And so they'll use like, they'll have different responses based on their personality in the game. It's, I haven't quite sussed it out yet, but it's, it's kind of, it's kind of weird that like the dialogue is, is like, it doesn't feel natural English. And I don't know if that's because they translated from some of the language or because parts of it are procedurally generated or because they're trying for that kind of weird feel like lots of it. Um, have you read, have you read Beowulf? Oh, uh, not in the original. I'll tell you that. Um, okay. uh, I mean, I've read, I've read passages of it, you know, translated. Yeah. Uh, almost all the translations that I've read of Beowulf have these compounded words like, you know, uh, file hard or like uh, knife sharp or whatever. And in Wildermyth, there are, there's a, a notable presence of that kind of, of wordsmithing where they'll have like, you know, the, the, the cloud, you know, whatever, uh, cloud studded or something. And, and, but they'll combine the words together and it has this very mythical kind of feel to it from its associations with, with the old poems. So, um, and the prose eddas, anyway, it, it has a, a very, um, a mythical kind of feel to it, which is really cool. And I'm curious, uh, to, to delve into it a little more and to see like what parts of it are actually someone wrote it down that way and what parts are actually being generated based on your character's personality and stuff. How interesting. Yeah. According to steam, it's a party based procedural t storytelling RPG. And it looks like, it looks like hand drawn. I mean, it it's made to look like hand drawn characters, like miniatures moving around a map, except yeah. they look well, like they're, paper, they're like cutouts. paper cutouts. Yeah, exactly. But they've got this, wonderful um modular systems where you can get like the character and then all their equipment like just like plops right on so it looks like it was drawn onto the character that way it it's oh, wow. really good wow yeah i've been enjoying it a lot and then the combat is um simple but not so simple it's not challenging and it's got enough interlocking mechanics to make it an interesting puzzle where you can just play it straight and be like okay everybody attack the thing or you can be clever about it and like approach it like a, a little puzzle and like i'm gonna do this guy move here and then I'm, this guy's gonna attack and then that guy's gonna attack and use this ability and use that ability and stuff it's uh it's very fun so i've been enjoying wildermyth well i just added it to my wish list because this looks really interesting yay oh, is it i'm watching the trailer and the the voiceover text you know you could has like the stuff the narrator is saying and it says something about your company of heroes and i'm like wait a minute that's a different franchise <laughs> <laughs> your different company game. of heroes here's the call of duty <laughs> i enter dun, the battle dun, 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 dun. <laughs> all right where are we in these stupid show notes wait sable what is this this had better not be a silver sable no no this is so i'm really enjoying wildermyth Sable, I also played this week and refunded. Not because it's a bad game, but because it reminded me too much of much better media that I I just like, I couldn't put up with the dissonance there. It felt like, um, so it's set in this kind of Middle Eastern uh, sand people tribal thing with a bit of high-tech magic stuff strewn right. around. I've, 
I saw this during the Steam like demo days or whatever it was this summer. Yeah. And I was really excited about it. I thought it looked amazing. I love the art. Yeah, it's got a beautiful cell shaded uh, shader that they're using to to put over the top of uh, 3D whatever 3D models they've got underneath. Um, but it just it reminded me too much of Nausicaa Valley of the Wind and Manifold Garden and Breath of the Wild, all of which are just really top-notch, pristine presentations. And Sable, while beautiful, is not in that tier. And so it felt it felt artistically pretentious, I guess. Like it like it was out of its weight class. Oh. And I just I couldn't enjoy it. it. When the art is so far above the gameplay that it <laughs> it sort of feels like this shouldn't have been a game. This should have just been an animation. Yeah, or something. I don't know. I don't know what I don't know what it was, but it felt it felt ugly. Like the the experience that I had was that it was an ugly game, even though it was like objectively a very pretty game, because like the visuals were evoking these other these other games that I played or or, or things that I had seen or watched, and I've read through like all the Nausicaa um, manga as well, and so it's just like it's not it's not that, and so like all the all the imperfections in the artistic presentation were pulling me out of the experience. We're like, oh, well, there's this little, you know, there's a bit of Z fighting here, and there's a bit of, like, um, there's some polygon uh, uh, sawtoothing, you know, in some places where it, it, like, intersects with stuff, or, like, the places right. where the where the shader decides to draw the lines. Uh, it just, like, it kept pulling me out, and I was like, I can't, I can't do this. Like, I'm, I'm sure that it's, it seems like a very cool game. Um, but like for me, it just, it wasn't possible for me to enjoy it. And so I was like, I'm not having fun here. Like this is, I'm actually becoming irritated by this. So I just, I refunded it, but, um, but it's a, yeah, it is a, a really cool game. And I, I wish I could enjoy it. What a shame. Well, let what do you say we do some mailbag questions? Yeah, we should. All right. Um, this first one. I included it thinking we were going to get some sort of Halloween show going. This is the only Halloween themed question that we have. Dear Diecast, not sure how you feel about YouTube web series, but a new genre known as analog horror has been popping up recently. And this one really grabbed my attention. Was wondering if you have any thoughts or feelings on it. And then a link to a YouTube video. Love, Yeknod. Um, yeah, so I've never seen, I know nothing about this genre. I haven't watched it. I still haven't watched this YouTube video. And I kind of like went to the page and just wasn't curious. So I have nothing to say on this. I think I would need to hear more from fans of whatever this is to entice me. Because <laughs> just, hey, <laughs> click on a YouTube video just feels like too much of a gamble. Um, so Paul... I, I don't suppose you've you, you know anything about this? No, in the spirit of episode three sixty no scope, I have not read any of the mailbags this week. <laughs> well, that was our one Halloween question, and it was a complete whiff. I am sorry, everybody. That's it. We have no more spooky questions. We have nothing going on. I don't have any ghost stories. I don't have any I don't have any we're, nobody's dressing up as Halloween is as anything for Halloween. Nobody's doing anything special. We're doing the thing where we put out our candy in a bowl. And it's just, you know, take some. Don't ring our doorbell. We're busy. On the doorstep. Right. Well, I'm sure Isaac will be able to fix it in post. He'll just he'll just make it spooky somehow. Right. Isaac, just insert a bunch of Halloween content right in here. Um, thanks. Sprinkle some jump scares around the diecast. I'm sure no one will mind <laughs> Dear Diecast, in reading comments about your GTA 4 analysis, and there's a link to your own website, the topic of reviews is raised. As usual, there's no consensus about the topic. Some people accept an A through D system. Hang on, this is this is long. Uh, Myers Briggs test, uh, music player rank scores are a matter of how good something is. Isn't that the point? Why grade a crappy game or listen to a bad music? Why do I care what degree something is bad? Chris P. All right, thanks, Chris. I didn't read all your email, but um, this is this is an interesting question. Yeah, it is. So the the thrust of it is, 
he, he talks about he, he switches at the end I, I assume this is a he Chris um I think is it the, is the rule that Chris Chris's that are female use K is that a real rule no there's Christine well I'm gonna assume it's hmm. a Chris dude <clears throat> I know the demographics of my audience um yeah. I know I know where what I would be betting on if we were in Vegas um <laughs> In... Seven out of ten, that's what you'd be betting on. <laughs> right. That's that's about right. Yeah. In um in your music in, in Chris's music player, he can rank something on a one to five scale. And I, I have this too. You know, it'll like let you rate tracks, but like why would you why would you use the why would you use a good to bad scale? Like, oh, you know, three is mediocre and four, you know, stars is pretty good. And then five is great. It's like, this is your own music collection. Why would you waste up? Why would you waste like star ratings on terrible songs? You just wouldn't have them in your collection. <laughs> right. I'm going to download this music and I'm going to rate it one star. I'm never going to listen to it. It's going to sit there with my player and take up space. <laughs> Right, just take up hard drive space for no reason. The song that I will never listen to. So, you know, when you're rating things for yourself, you of course want good to great. But then, but then there's this disagreement among among the public. Like, what does a fifty percent mean? Does that mean a middle of the road title, or is that terrible? Are we using grades like in school where fifty percent is a failure? Or are we using averages where 50% is, you know, average? And of course, there's no agreement and everybody has their own idea of how the scale should work. And, um, yeah. Right. Or, or is it like 50% as in eBay vendor scores in which, like, never ever buy anything from this person? Oh, right. If anything less than, like, 90% is, like, danger. Yeah. I only buy games that win game of the year. <laughs> yeah, Actually, yeah, it's very terrible. weird. <laughs> um, and now Chris goes on in the in the middle chapters of this email. He talks about um, how much does this sort of different ideas of how rating systems like different people have different ideas of how rating systems should work. How much? And then he poses the question: How much should that line up with like Myers Briggs personality types? I don't want to talk about Myers Briggs every time I bring it up. It I I'm annoyed with it now because every time I bring it up, there's always just some you know the there'll be twenty people going. This is so useful to me, and then there'll be some asshole that's like, "It's a bunch of crap. It's stupid. I don't know why anybody listens." It's like, did you read any of the previous comments? Maybe this isn't for you, genius. <laughs> So it's an annoying wow. conversation to have. Yeah. yeah well, and, and reviews in general are basically unsolicited advice, right? Like, right. here's this thing, and then, like, here's all these strangers giving me unsolicited advice on, on it. And it's like, well, on the one hand, like, I'm going to look at the reviews, so it's kind of solicited. But on the other hand, it's like, I don't know where they're coming from. I don't know what kind of people they yeah. are and what kind of things they like. And, like, wouldn't it be nice if Steam had a thing where it's like, Here's all the reviews from people who also like this genre of game. So you could like filter them out. Right. It's sort of like if if you could form your own stable of trusted reviewers, like, you know, over time. But it's you can't track like multiple you just have to do it manually. You can't get an automatic all right, add this person to the collection of people I think is not crazy. Yeah. Or even, like, people whose opinion I value on this specific genre of game. Because, like, oh, I play different yeah. genres. Sometimes I'm looking for a puzzle game, and I don't want someone who's playing, like, simulation games to give me their advice on that. Like, I want someone who likes puzzle games to give me their advice on that. So, it's, uh, yeah, reviews are, are fraught, for sure. Yeah, oh, yeah, that's true. Like, when I review a JRPG, it's a curiosity. It's not, oh, here's an expert JRPG player giving his, you know, expert view on, the, you know, using his knowledge of the genre. This is like, oh, here's a casual fan that wandered in and, like, here's his reaction. 
to one of these games. That's useful, right. but it's not it's not useful as consumer advice. It's useful as a curiosity where, you know, somebody who's a real expert on JRPGs and has played a lot of them and has had a lot to say about them over the year, I'll really value, you know, what they say to, about a JRPG or whatever. That's true. Looking at you, the Rocketeer. I was just, I was just wondering, should I bring up the Rocketeer again? <laughs> <laughs> or And vice versa, like... You know, you write something about like referencing Mass Effect, and someone's like, "Yeah, but have you even played Mass Effect?" And you're like, "Hang on, wait a minute." Like, I yes, yes, actually, I have. <laughs> it, it would be nice if there was some way to like con to convey like the areas in which you are uh, an expert. Not only have I talked about Mass Effect, but I've complained about it at length. In fact, I wrote the book on it. <laughs> yes. Yeah. All right. Yeah, so I don't know. This is almost too big a discussion for you and I. Like, this is such a big topic. You could, you could do, like, a thesis on this. It's just such a huge topic. There's so many directions you could take it. Like, what do these different numbers... The fact that we all have different expectations and the fact that there are many different scales in use out there and I don't just mean some people use stars and some people use percentages. I mean, like, you know, different scales for where is terrible on your scale. Right. And then we've yeah. got aggregators collecting all of these disparate... Can you imagine, like, somebody's gathering up weather data and they hoover up all this temperature data and just start averaging it together, but they don't keep track of which readings are Fahrenheit and which are Celsius. They just like average them all together. Right. It's or, like, or the location on the earth. Right. Right. It's like, okay, cold times will be cold in both scales. But like you, when you see a score of, of 50, you have no idea if that's slightly chilly or, um, dangerously hot. Right. Yeah. Like yeah. life threateningly and, and, hot. Well, and then Chris also recommends like maybe, maybe you should, maybe you should just like simplify it so that it's just like good things get a rating, bad things don't get a rating. Which, like, that's not really a solution either because if you if something is actually bad, then you want to be able to tell other people, hey, look out for this. Don't like, don't engage with this thing. It's bad, right? Right. I remember when I used to read PC Gamer, my, the first thing I would do is read any review below 10%. That was my favorite thing to do. Like, those were the best reviews. <laughs> right. Because, and that was really, I mean, I didn't get it at the time, but in a good review, the reviewer has to spend the entire review talking about the product and its features. And there's going to be, ex okay, I'm talking about Half-Life 2. There, there's a lot of fans. They're all expecting different things. They all want to know what's in this game. What's it like? They all have very specific questions about this game. When I'm talking about right. um, Ultimate Paint Brawl 3D made using the, <laughs> the build engine that is now like eight years old and horribly out of date. This is an actual review I read. You know, and nobody cares about it. Nobody knew this game was coming out and nobody has any expectations. I'm free. I can use the entire column space to express myself and I can be very creative and you can find ways to work jokes into the thing that does not work. If you just have, you know, 30 bullet points, you've got to get your, you've got to get through, you know, in your page and a half of space. Yeah. So all the creativity was on the was on the lowest reviews and that made them fun to read yeah yeah so rating things is really really difficult and uh like you said i don't think we can really do it justice don't forget to like share and subscribe right hello seamus and paul earlier this year jessica walter who is famous for her roles on arrested development and of course vo voiced mallory archer on archer passed away um did you guys watch season 12 of Archer? How did you think they handled her leaving the show? Also, what is your favorite Mallory Archer quote? Do you think the show can go on without her? Sincerely, 
uh, lane dirt, which my brain really wants to just say is lawn dart. But the pronunciation guide says lane dirt. So that's what we'll go with. So um, I'm going to say something vaguely heretical here. I, am I have not huge... watched either Arrested Development or Archer, so you can't offend me. All right. I'm a huge fan of Archer. I absolutely love it. For those who haven't watched Archer, it's like a James Bond riff. It's an animated show. And uh, it's basically transporting Bond to the modern world and imagining what an asshole he would be. I mean, he drinks too much. You know, it's funny in the movies when he's a heavy drinking, womanizing, you know, devil may care, bad boy. But actually getting any work done with that guy would be a nightmare. <laughs> right. Um, you don't want him as a co-worker. That's why he's always out by himself, right? Right. And um, I like that, especially the early the early seasons of the show when they were really le leaning into the James Bond stuff. And then they kind of like worked their way through the list of James Bond tropes. And then they were like, oh, and they, I think the show should have ended. I think the show should have ended like season three or four. I think they were done. Uh, mm -hmm. And it's, and we're in season 12 now. And it's just that he was originally riffing on a genre but it's done with the genre riff they told all the james bond jokes they could think of and now it's just characters endlessly repeating their catchphrases and oh, no. i mean it's not bad it's still charming if you like these characters they are still charming in their own way kind of you know the way it was charming when i don't know like pierce on mash would show up and be kind of a dick would show up and be lecherous in a way that only a TV character could get away with. Like, haha, it's funny on a TV show, but in person this would be horrifying. Right. But it's television and it's night it's the 1970s, so it's funny. Um and then Archer is funny because he thinks he's in the 1970s, but he's not. Exactly. Yeah. A lot of the joke is sort of like he keeps acting like 1960s James Bond. And that's just not cool anymore. <laughs> Maybe um, it was never cool, but it's certainly not cool now. Oh, I loved Archer, but the show and but the show should have should have ended eight seasons ago. I love it, but I I think they're out of jokes. So um and yeah, they did pay tribute with my favorite at Mallory Archer quote. I yeah, I can't say that on the show. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was trying to think of a... I would just have to explain my way around this entire joke. It's too awkward. But Mallory Archer is very old. She has a lot of old ideas. And she occasionally says things that would be considered incredibly outrageous in 1970. And are, like, even worse today. <laughs> like, she w she said things that were outrageous when she was a young spy you know 40 years ago and now she continues be to behave the exact same way so the joke is and, like the 40s or whatever right <laughs> right and uh yeah i can't i can't repeat any of the stuff that she says um except it uh yeah, I liked the send-off they gave her. I was expecting they would kill her off, but no, they just had her run off and retire. Um, hmm. Yeah. So, um, I'm not in a hurry to watch the... I, I watched it on YouTube. I didn't watch the show. I, I quit watching the show ages ago. So, uh, basically, a lot of really talented people make that show. I, I really wish that... The producers would cut them loose and let them go make something else. They're brilliant people. They could be making us, they could be telling us new jokes. Um, what do you think? You want to try one more? Yeah, I think we've got time for one more. All right, go ahead. We'll take this next one. Dear Diecast, my brain works in mysterious ways. Sometimes a silly idea enters my mind and no matter what I do, I invariably drift back to thinking about it. And the latest idea is this. What if a lich had Twitter as his phylactery? One step further, what if the entire internet was his phylactery? 
I've thought an embarrassingly long time about this, so I've decided to try and loop you in as well. I've boiled it down to two pivotal points. Number one, given traditional fantasy rules, would that even work, especially with websites as massive as Twitter or Facebook? Or the entire internet for that matter? Which part of a server would need to be as phylactery so that the entire social network slash internet serves as his phylactery? Number two, and if we manage to solve the issue above, how could we kill him without bombing humanity's infrastructure back to the Stone Age? And barring that, could we maybe hide from him somehow? I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. Smiley face. Keeping awesome. Lino. Thank you, Lino. That is a terrifying thought. All right. I actually checked the rules on this. No joking. In the in a phylactery must be a physical object. It may not be. Um, you can't like. I think the rules say you can't like make it a bunch of gas or something. You know, it can't be vapor. Um, which I would so say it's a that solid would, object. Right, it needs to be a solid object, which would also rule out it being like the abstract internet data. It needs to be a <laughs> physical piece of infrastructure, which means not only can it not be all of Facebook, it would have to be one particular piece of hardware in Facebook. So one data, one piece of hardware in one computer, in one server rack, in one data center in Facebook. Is there's and, a size limit? Um, there's a price limit. It has to be fairly. Uh -huh. I don't know how much two thousand gold is in modern money. It's probably two thousand bucks, just because of how stupid, <laughs> you know, we translate yeah. money from the past is. But yeah, it needs to be a valuable object. Oh, but there's no upper so, limit. I was saying, like maybe if like the whole server farm or whatever. Yeah. Oh, it can't be made of wood. That's another important thing. It cannot be made of wood hmm. and it cannot be, they don't, you can't make it some cheap piece of thing. You can't make it a piece of junk. It has to be valuable. I think the rules are trying to push you to make it something ornate. Like, oh, it should have some, the, the price is there to encourage you to like put some jewels on it and make it very obviously a thing of value as opposed to but you could get around that by like oh it needs to cost 2000 gold well then okay i'm going to make this this lump this featureless lump of pewter and have it delivered by ship sailing around the world the wrong way like there now it costs $2000 <laughs> make it cost $2000 <laughs> right oh, no. like Right, like, so, I'm not sure what the, it's supposed to be a valuable object. So, I don't know what to think of that, because obviously anything economic like that, you can, you can get up to all kinds of economic shenanigans. Like, yeah, so, it has so to you could make it like much. the electrons in the internet or whatever. Right, it has to be, like, I would think it has to be like a specific hard drive or a specific motherboard or a specific CPU. But I mean, it's a lich, those are dangerous. Uh, what I suggest is we do this, and then we bomb all of Facebook's data centers just to be safe, just to make sure that we get it and that it's good and dead. <laughs> you can never be too sure. And we bomb it again and be like, sorry, Mark Zuckerberg, boy, I sure am gonna miss Facebook, but you know, liches are bad, <laughs> sorry. I, I don't know. I I would assume that Twitter is already this. I mean, like, really, right. this seems like a question for Robert Miles more than it is for the diecast. Right, Twitter. Oh, I should have picked Twitter as my example thing. I mean, I'm still on Facebook, but I quit Twitter. I quit Twitter in disgust years ago. And I keep thinking, and I, you know, people keep pointing out, look, Twitter's really important for, like, networking and spreading and, like, you know, people want to go... Oh, Seamus has a new book at Seamus, you know, he wrote this book and I love it. Like that's really important for spreading your work around and getting people to talk about it is being available to be talked about on Twitter. But then I think about just like creating an account and going back into the sewer and I'm like, nah. Mm. Yeah. Nah. Mm. Yeah. I think it's already a lich. It's already, it's already trying to suck the, the psychic energy out of everything. Yeah. I think it's working. I think it's working. There you go, Lino. Get your bombs out. We're going to bomb it back to the Stone Age. We've got to bomb Twitter. I'm sorry. We just, we have to. 
There's no choice. I mean, maybe we could just like unplug that specific server and destroy it, but I don't want to take any chances. <laughs> they've infiltrated everything by now. You know, this really is the perfect spooky Halloween question. I think I think we did it. Yay! No, the more horrible thing is, what if there's not a lich in Twitter and it's just like that for some reason? <laughs> it's just humanity, actually. What if people are actually that bad? Oh, chilling. Oh, no. Oh, no. Well, thanks to everybody who sent in questions to the show. If you, We still have a few questions here. In fact, we, we got through over half of them. Oh, and another question came in while we were doing the show. Um, Babylon, though the topic is Babylon 5 reboot. Oh, man. We'll talk about that next week. Okay. Thanks so much to everybody who sent in a question. If you've got a question for the show, our email is diecast at shamusyoung.com. Thanks for listening and happy Halloween, everybody. Say goodbye, Paul. Paul considered doing a comedy outro playing on the Dune inner monologue, but he thought better of it. Decided to go with the standby of saying goodbye, Paul. <laughs> <laughs>